Good Monday morning, everyone. A big week ahead on the podcast. Uh, next time on Wednesday, we're going to look at uh, what we as Christians do with our disordered desires. We still have those disordered loves within us, so what do we do with them? As on Wednesday, Friday, we look at whether or not we can become more holy if we treat our bodies more harshly, which is a key discussion on asceticism, really important. But first up, uh, the week starts as we look at the power of our adversary, the devil. Uh, the Bible tells us that Satan has been disarmed. Uh, so what did he get disarmed of? What powers did he have that he no longer possesses? That's the question from a podcast listener named Dan in Altoona, Iowa. Pastor John, hello. Colossians 2.15 tells us our Savior Jesus Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. It's a great text. But uh, what is here meant by disarmed? Uh, was there something they were wielding then that they do not wield now? And if so, what is the weapon Paul speaks of here in this text? I love this question because I love the glorious truth, uh, not only of Colossians 2.15, but the way verses 13 and 14 prepare for it and, and put a massive foundation under it. So let's read the whole unit and then I'll, I'll give uh, a couple answers to the question, in what sense did the death of Christ strip Satan and his demons of their weapons? Here's the verse verses. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, with Christ. Having forgiven us all our trespasses, how? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside. How? Nailing it to the cross. And, he, and here comes the, the key verse uh, we're being asked about. He disarmed, this is verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him, in Christ and in the cross. This is one of the greatest passages, I think, in the Bible yes. about what really happened when Christ died. So let me describe seven terrible and wonderful things in the order in which they happened in this text uh, and end by describing the glorious disarming of rulers and authorities. First, we were dead in trespasses and sins. All human beings are spiritually dead and blind to the reality of the glory of Christ. We are as dead to spiritual truth as a human corpse is dead to being touched. Paul describes the legal nature of this condition in verse 14 with the phrase, a record of debt stood against us with its legal demands. In other words, we're not only spiritually impervious to God's touch, but we are legally condemned by the long record of sins that stood against us. Second, God took that long list, that record of sins, and put it in the hand of Christ and drove a spike through it and through his hand so that he became a substitute for us, bearing the punishment for the record of our debts in his own death. He nailed it, the text says, he nailed it to the cross. Third, then verse 14 makes explicit that this nailing of the record of our debt to the cross canceled, it canceled the record of our debt. It is canceled. The debt is canceled because the debt of punishment that we owe to the justice of God has been paid in the punishment of Christ on the cross. Fourth, then Paul adds, he set the record of our sins aside. Literally, it says he took it out of the midst. Very unusual mm -hmm thing to say. In other words, in the courtroom of heaven, where our record of debt guarantees our condemnation, nobody can find it. <laughs> it's taken 
where where did it go? We, this was in the folder here just a minute ago. It's taken out of the myth. It's gone as far as the east is from the west. So far does he remove our transgressions from us. Fifth, then he makes explicit that the effect of our sins uh, being nailed and, and the record of debt being taken out of the way, the effect is we're forgiven. He applies to us personally what Christ accomplished perfectly. When we are united to Christ by faith, his punishment becomes ours and his righteousness becomes ours and God counts our sins against us no more. Sixth, Paul says in verse 13, therefore God made us alive with him because our sins are forgiven. He makes us eternally alive. Now, we're no longer a corpse anymore that can't be touched by spiritual reality. We see Christ for who he is, and we are moved to prefer him and prize him and treasure him and love him and trust him above all things. And now, on the basis of those six terrible and glorious realities, we see in verse 15 that something amazing happened to the rulers and authorities, to Satan and his cosmic forces in the heavenly places, as it says in uh, Ephesians 6. He disarmed, this is verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame, triumphing over them in him. The word translated disarmed means literally stripped. It's used one other place, namely in chapter 3, verse 9, where the Christians are to strip off their old nature. So what we see first in verse 15 is that just when people thought Jesus was being stripped of his clothing and shamed in nakedness at his final trial and led in triumphal procession to Calvary, what was really happening was the reverse, namely Satan and his demonic forces were being stripped, they were being shamed, they were being led in triumphal procession. And I I see three ways, or I'm only going to mention two, there are more, two ways that the achievement of the uh, death of Jesus in verses 13 and 14 bring about this stripping or this disarming of Satan and his rulers. First, we know from Revelation 12.10 that Satan, by the very meaning of his name, is the great accuser. Satan can do a lot of damage to to us physically, emotionally, relationally in this world, but he can only condemn us or damn us or bring us to eternal ruin in one way, namely by a valid accusation of our sins before a holy God. If he can do that, we're done for. If he can make our sins stick Mm. in the courtroom of heaven as he accuses us before the judge of the universe, we're doomed, we're hopeless. And the point of verses 13 and 14 is that the record of death that Satan could use to accuse us and condemn us has been nailed to the cross. The one damning weapon that he has, namely unforgiven sin, with which he could accuse us, has been stripped out of his hands. This is what Paul meant, I think, when he said in Romans 8.33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. So the first way that the demonic world was stripped and disarmed by the cross is that The power to accuse God's people successfully has been taken away. That sin is already punished. It was nailed to the cross. We can't be accused with it. And the second thing, the the only other thing I'll, I'll mention, is a glorious thing experientially now, namely, Satan was robbed powers and the rulers, the authorities were robbed, stripped of their power 
to hold us in slavery to the fear of death. Now, I get that straight out of Hebrews 2.14, which is an absolutely amazing, wonderful verse. Since therefore the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, that is, we're human. He himself, that's Christ, likewise partook of the same nature. He became human. That through death, so he, he became human so he could die. That through death, that's what happened in Colossians 2.14, he might nullify the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Nullify, abrogate, revoke, abolish. When when Christ died in our place, he took the sting out of death because he took sin out of death. He took condemnation out of death, and so he took fear out of death, which means that the second great weapon of the devil— that was stripped from him is the the power to hold us in bondage, which is what the next verse in Hebrew says. He, he held us in bondage through the fear of death our whole life long. And he can't do that anymore. He has been disarmed of the weapon of fear of dying because the sting of Death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, and all of it has been satisfied and punished on the cross. So you can see why I love Colossians 2, 13 to 15. The riches of these verses are infinite, Mm. and I encourage you to spend hours pondering the glories of what God achieved for us on the cross, especially as it relates to the devil and and the evil rulers and authorities. And I've only mentioned two. Uh, There are other ways that Satan has been stripped, but these two are wonderful. Hmm. Power to condemn us with sin, stripped. Power to terrify us with death, stripped. Amen. Colossians 1 and 2 are stunning chapters. Thank you, Pastor John, for walking us through this text in Colossians 2.15. And Dan in Altoona, Iowa, great question. Thanks for sending the question in and taking the time to write it out for us. If you have a great Bible question for Pastor John, send it to us at our online home at desiringgod.org forward slash ask Pastor John. Well, next up, we talk about divided hearts. What do we do with these divided hearts of ours, these hearts still struggling with inordinate desires, inordinate loves? Uh, That's up next time. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. We'll see you back here on Wednesday for that. See you then.